Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Professor Burlingame. I'll always be grateful for your scholarship and writing, and uh, which greatly aided me in my understanding of Lincoln. It is a tremendous honor to be speaking to members of the Abraham Lincoln Association this morning. I was hoping against hope to be with you in Springfield, to meet you all in person and to sign your books, but I trust the opportunity will arise in the future when we all feel a little safer. I'll talk a little bit about the idea behind this book, which was published last year and comes out in paperback next month. My two previous books focused on another aspect of 19th century American history, the great game of baseball. 59 and 84 was about the grittiest of competitors, Old Hoss Radborn, who won more games in a single season than any pitcher in history. He was so ornery that he was the first human being photographed giving the middle finger. I think that that, that book, you might notice he's doing that uh, with his left hand there. I think that book did have some impact when a copy of Radborn's 1887 baseball card showing that pose was auctioned off in 2017. It sold for $9,600, which was 24 times the original estimate when it went on auction. My second book was The Summer of Beer and Whiskey about a wonderfully funny and idiosyncratic German immigrant named Chris Vondere, who helped save baseball, even though he knew next to nothing about it. That book sold very well, and I think the title didn't hurt. But of course, anyone who wants to understand the most remarkable figures of the 19th century must be drawn to Abraham Lincoln. We all know Lincoln loved to tell stories, including some I would be wary of sharing on Zoom. But he once told a tale about a man who was probably Lincoln himself, a fellow whose features the ladies would not call handsome. When riding through the woods, this fellow met a lady on horseback. He waited for her to pass, but instead she scrutinized him carefully before saying, well, for land's sake, you were the homeliest man I ever saw. Yes, madam, but I can't help it, he replied. No, I suppose not, she said, but you might stay at home. I can relate to that story. I've often thought I am something of an interloper in the field of Lincoln scholarship. I'm a lifelong journalist, and as I mentioned, I was known more as a baseball historian than anything else in the realm of books. I might have stayed at home too. As of last year, some 15,000 books about Abraham Lincoln had been published, more than about any human being other than Jesus Christ. I think we know this picture. Across the street from Ford's Theater in Washington is a museum store with a literal tower of books about Lincoln glued together. I admit I found that daunting. How could I have the nerve to add anything more? Well, what made me proceed was my feeling that there was a gripping story about Lincoln that had never been told in this way. This story is basically 24 hours in the life of Abraham Lincoln. From the evening of March 3rd, 1865, through his second inauguration to the evening of March 4th, 1865, 156 years ago. This is a lens through which I think we can see in remarkably sharp detail the immense suffering unleashed by the Civil War and to grasp the ultimate meaning of that war as Lincoln explained it in his greatest and most profound speech. Lincoln argued that all this misery was the price America had to pay for the evil of slavery. The great Southern writer and historian Shelby Foote said, any understanding of this nation has to be based, and I mean really based, on the understanding of the Civil War. It defined us. If you're going to understand the American character, you've got to learn about this enormous catastrophe in the mid-19th century. 
it was the crossroads of our being. And it was a hell of a crossroads. This day in March, I believe, was the crossroads of the Civil War. It moved us towards an understanding of that great catastrophe. And it helped Americans aspire for peaceful coexistence in a more perfect union. That is a task that obviously still challenges us. I believe a very narrow focus on a historical event can give us an understanding that the usual omniscient historical view cannot. It brings us very close to the ground instead of viewing everything 30,000 feet up. Studied in the course of one day, historical figures almost magically become flesh and blood, real human beings, subject to emotions and other vicissitudes, including the politics of the moment. It becomes clearer they were groping in the dark and had no idea how things would turn out. With this forced perspective, we also get a stronger sense of how everything looked, sounded, and smelled. I love that. There's something that I noticed about this day from the time I started looking at it. Very famous people keep popping in and out of it, interacting with Lincoln and each other, interwoven like a tapestry. Frederick Douglass, Walt Whitman, Salmon P. Chase and his charming and ambitious and vivacious daughter, Kate, John Wilkes Booth, the great photographer, Alexander Gardner, Clara Barton, they keep turning up in each other's stories. I found that their perspectives also helped underscore the tragedy of that war and the passions people felt. And their experience revealed the gale force political winds that were tearing through America that day. I thought I'd read a few passages from the book to try to give you some flavor of that. I'll first read from the prologue of the book helping to explain what Lincoln was up against on that day. <clears throat> By 1865, four years of Lincoln's brutal, unremitting pressure was at last breaking the Confederacy, but the price had been horrendous. Nearly 750,000 young men had died so far many rolled into unmarked graves far from home and loved ones. Countless thousands of survivors had been left like, Connor, uh, like Selden Connor, debilitated or horribly disfigured. When the war started, virtually no one had expected savagery on this scale, an appalling blot on a country conceived in liberty and dedicated to the enlightenment values of self-government in the peaceful resolution of political differences. Lincoln himself, a frequent visitor at Union hospitals, was horrified. As the president's friend Ward Hill Lamont recalled, it was the havoc of the war, the sacrifice of patriotic lives, the flow of human blood, the mangling of precious limbs in the great Union host that shocked him the most. Indeed, on some occasions, shocked him almost beyond his capacity to control either his judgment or his feeling. Lincoln had dedicated his life to the rule of law and the peaceful settlement of differences. He argued that each man, white or black, carried the spark of divinity and merited freedom. And then he presided over the wholesale slaughter of America's young men. The dead the dead, the dead, our dead, or north or south, ours all. Our young men, once so handsome and so joyous, taken from us, the son from the mother, the husband from the wife, the dear friend from the dear friend, Brooklyn poet Walt Whitman lamented. And everywhere among these countless graves we see, and ages yet may see, on monuments and gravestones, singly or in masses, to thousands or tens of thousands, the significant war, word unknown. As Lincoln's first term approached its end in the winter of 1865, bodyguard William H. Crook recalled, Death was on every hand. 
The black badge of mourning was seen on every side and those connected with the White House where centered the entire nervous system of the nation felt the strain of conflict, the grief and sorrow so poignantly and so constantly that it is no wonder gaiety and lightness of spirit were absent for the most part. One of the things I try to do in every drop of blood is explain what Washington was like on that day. It was a sleepy Southern city that had been transformed by the war, filled to the bursting point with people, and not up to the task of hosting a massive centralized government. I thought I'd read a passage about that. This teeming slapdash city was not to everyone's taste. Of all detestable places, Washington is first. Manhattan lawyer George Templeton Strong complained. Crowds, heat, bad quarters, bad fare, bad smells, mosquitoes, and a plague of flies transcending everything within my experience. Beelzebub surely reigns here, and Willard's Hotel is his temple. File smelling animal pens dotted the city. The streets were full of rooting hogs, dirt, decaying horse manure, and rotting animal carcasses that waited to be picked up by the city carrion cart. Dilapidated and unfinished structures teetered alongside handsome new ones. Its buildings, like its population, present a most incongruous medley, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Beauty and deformity are grouped together with a great preponderance of the latter, journalist Lewis, Lois Bryan Adams wrote. Washington was a cesspool into which drained all the iniquity and filth of the nation, wrote a New York Times reporter who arrived in 1862. It was filled with runaway Negroes, contractors, adventurers, office seekers, gamblers, confidence men, courtesans, uniformed officers shirking their duties and the riffraff, the outscourings of all creation. A Michigan soldier visiting the capital in November 1861 found it dominated by three large groups of people. First were soldiers. The other two he wrote in his diary were politicians and prostitutes, both very numerous and about equal in numbers, honesty, and morality. The worst of Washington's physical features was surely the reeking city canal which ran from 17 streets south of the White House, passed along the northern end of the mall and veered south at the foot of Capitol Hill in two branches that fed into the Anacostia River. Built at great expense to accommodate fat barges and encourage trade with the West, it was a majestic 80 feet wide at points, but it never drew much traffic. And by the 1850s, whatever use it once had as a canal was over. Now it was nothing but a stinking open cesspool, attracting swarms of flies and mosquitoes for much of the year and emitting a stench of human waste that on the worst days reached the White House. Let's see, John Wilkes Booth. One of the key characters in the book is John Wilkes Booth who stalks Lincoln at the inauguration. He was a charming, very popular actor who captured women's hearts and was generous and kind to children. But he came to symbolize the terrible hatred for Abraham Lincoln that millions of Americans felt, and that finally led to his murder. Booth thought Lincoln had betrayed the founders and shredded the Constitution. Quote, how I have loved the old flag could never now be known, he wrote. Oh, how I have longed to see her break from the mist of blood and death that circles round her folds, spoiling her beauty and tarnishing her honor. But no, day by day, she has been dragged deeper and deeper into cruelty and oppression. Till now, in my eyes, her once bright red stripes look like bloody gashes on the face of heaven. He stalks Lincoln that day, perhaps with a desire to kill him on a very big stage. We will see Booth slip in behind the president on his way to the podium, 
to deliver his greatest speech. Another leading figure this day is the poet and journalist Walt Whitman, author of Leaves of Grass, then widely considered a very dirty book. Whitman had been in Washington doing government jobs to survive and doing some freelance articles for newspapers, but spending most of his free time tending to wounded soldiers in the city's dirty and crowded hospitals. I find it fascinating that before almost anyone else, Whitman grasped Lincoln's special and even mythic qualities as a quintessentially American hero. And I explore that in the book. How I love this president personally, he wrote. He has a face like a Hoosier Michelangelo, so awful ugly it becomes beautiful with its strange mouth, its deep cut crisscross lines and its donut complexion. Lincoln, of course, is at the heart of the book. I thought I'd read a short passage about his childhood that has always struck me powerfully. I dedicated this book to my own mother who died of cancer long ago when I was in my early 20s. Childhood trauma had scarred Lincoln. When he was only nine, he lost his mother, Nancy, to a sudden ghastly illness from what seems the purest fate, her drinking the milk of a cow that had happened to chew on a plant that was toxic to humans. All that I am or hope ever to be, I got from my mother, Lincoln had written of her, according to her, his law partner, William Herden. She was intellectual, sensitive, and somewhat sad. In an act of gross irresponsibility, his father, Thomas, almost immediately thereafter, left young Abe and his older sister, Sarah, in their log cabin in the wilderness of Indiana, putting them under the care of an inept teenage relative so that Thomas could return to Kentucky to find a new wife. The children were soon filthy and on the edge of starvation. During the months their father was gone, they survived on the dried berries that Nancy had put aside and on whatever they could find or kill nearby. It was a wild region with many bears and other animals still in the woods, Abraham remembered. Sarah, who endeavored to cook and keep house, often sat by the fire and cried. Later in life, Lincoln wrote of the sad, if not pitiful condition of the two. When he revisited the place of his childhood in his late thirties, he did not indulge in fond nostalgia, but rather recalled the little boy's abject terror in a stanza of the poem he felt stirred to write, The Bear Hunt. When my father settled here, twas then the frontier line. The panther's scream filled the night with fear and bears preyed on the swine. Some of the most damaging ordeals any child could suffer, the loss of a mother, abandonment, nights filled with fear, loneliness, filth, cold, and hunger were among Lincoln's formative experiences. And when he was 19, his beloved sister, Sarah, died in the agonies of childbirth. In an 1862 letter to a grieving child, he wrote, in the sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all and to the young it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. I have had experience enough to know what I say. The sorrow never left him. Lincoln's melancholy never failed to impress any man who ever saw or knew him. The perpetual look of sadness was his most prominent feature, Herndon said. <clears throat> The great freedom fighter, Frederick Douglass, is a major figure in the book. One of the themes of Every Drop of Blood is Douglass's shift in his perception of Lincoln. From a waffling politician devoid of character who cared little about blacks to a radical champion for African-American rights. Among other things I describe in the book his first meeting with Lincoln when Douglass was furious that Lincoln had approved of official discrimination in paying black soldiers less than white soldiers. If 
Five months later, seeking to get black enlistees equal pay, Douglas arranged to meet with Lincoln in person. Given the fierce racial prejudice of the times and the bitterness of his invectives against the president, Douglas approached the session with some trepidation. At the White House, he found that the stairway was crowded with applicants. And as I was the only dark spot among them, I expected to have to wait at least half a day. But within two minutes, he was ushered into Lincoln's office, finding the president seated in a low armchair with his feet extended on the floor, surrounded by a large number of documents and several busy secretaries. Lincoln immediately put Douglas at ease. I know who you are, Mr. Douglas. Mr. Seward has told me all about you. The president said, sit down. I'm glad to see you. Douglas was surprised. He later related, in his company, I was never in any way reminded of my humble origin or my unpopular color, a remarkable thing at the time. Nonetheless, Douglas pulled no punches. When Lincoln asked him his views of the political and military situation, Douglas said he was most disheartened by the tardy, hesitating, vacillating policy of the President of the United States. Lincoln allowed that he might seem slow, but he did not vacillate. I think it cannot be shown that when I have once taken a position, I have ever retreated from it. On the question of equal pay, Lincoln argued with typical pragmatism that black men had larger motives for being soldiers than white men and ought to be willing to enter the service upon any condition. He knew that African-American service and saying the, saving the Union would make a powerful case for the final destruction of slavery and the recognition of their rights. While the inequality of pay was a necessary condition to smooth the way, Lincoln promised that it would be corrected over time. We had to make some concessions to prejudice, he said. I assure you, Mr. Douglas, that in the end, they shall have the same pay as white soldiers. Douglas was not entirely satisfied with his views, but left the meeting with a new appreciation of the president. At the very least, Lincoln clearly respected him and seemed genuinely interested in his perspective. Douglas continued urging black men to fight despite their lower pay few to no opportunities for advancement in the ranks and a far grimmer disadvantage, the serious risk of being executed or sold back into slavery if captured by the Confederates. He recognized that if black men fought to save the nation, they would be making an almost unanswerable argument for full citizenship. Shall colored men enlist notwithstanding this unjust and ungenerous barrier raised against them? We answer yes, go into the army and go with a will and a determination to blot out this and all other means of discrimination against us, Douglas implored. Once in the United States uniform and the colored man has a springing board under him by which he can jump to loftier heights. This picture shows the burning of Columbia, South Carolina on February 17th. On March 4th, General Sherman was still ravaging South Carolina, occupying the town of Chira. Researching this period, I was struck by Southern white women's diaries and their fierce bitterness towards the Yankees and desire to fight on. They had lost much and didn't want it to be for nothing. A 17-year-old Columbia girl named Emma LeCompte pondered God's punishment for the Union troops. The word Yankee, she wrote, has become a synonym for all that is mean, despicable, and abhorrent. I wonder if the vengeance of heaven will not pursue such fiends. My cat has joined us. Before they came here, I thought I hated them as much as was possible. Now I know there are no limits to the feeling of hatred. Now let's dip into the book and take a look at another woman in Sherman's path, Emma Holmes. On this same Saturday, Emma Holmes, 26, sat down with her diary and pen in devastated Camden, South Carolina, 
and filled page after page with fresh memories of the last two weeks of anguish, an experience so otherworldly that it now seemed like a dream or a nightmare. The daughter of a once wealthy plantation owner and physician, she had left her beautiful seaside city of Charleston in 1862 after a fire had consumed the family mansion. And she now taught eight children in the wealthy household of John Mickle. In recent days, General William Tecumseh Sherman's troops had rampaged through Camden and waves of soldiers had ransacked the Mickle mansion for two harrowing days. Not the slightest box of even children's baby clothes or toys escaped their hands, save the top of my hat box, Holmes wrote. Soldiers rolled cartloads of meat, turkey, and chickens away from the estate, along with 80 bales of cotton. The troops could not get their hands on the family silver, however, it had been buried in the woods. Lincoln had resolved through Sherman to drive the war deep into the South, a psychological as well as geographical invasion, demonstrating to Confederate leaders and the civilians who supported them that Union forces could now freely enter their homes, ransack their goods, burn their mills and factories, abuse their slaves, and terrorize their wives and children. Thousands of people may perish, Sherman admitted, but Southerners would finally realize that war means something else than vainglory and boasting. If peace ever falls to their lot, they will never again invite war. General Philip Sher Sheridan had done much the same in devastating Virginia's once fertile Shenandoah Valley, the main source of food for General Robert E. Lee's tattered army. Lincoln wanted to make it clear that further resistance was futile and that this horrible war must end. Dexter Horton, an Indiana soldier in Sherman's army wrote to his wife, our march over the country has been like the blighting pestilence for we have taken or turned upside down everything before us. Here's General Sherman who explained, we are not only fighting hostile armies, but a hostile people and must make old and young, rich and poor feel the hard hand of war as well as their organized armies. Finally, I thought I'd read a little bit about Lincoln's great inaugural address that day. It was only 700 words long and could be read in five to six minutes and would easily fit in a column of type in a newspaper. It was savagely attacked at the time by Democrats who found it monstrous that a president would be talking about God's will, as if a politician knew anything about that. In the height of hypocrisy to talk of malice toward none when Lincoln was decimating the Confederate armies and crushing the South under his boot. Both sides in this war, he was arguing, shared responsibility for the grievous offense of slavery. Both sides had brought it to these shores, nurtured it, endured it, and sustained it. As a result, some four million Black Americans had lived and worked under it under brutal conditions, suffering the pain and indignity of the lash and perhaps more agonizing, permanent separation from loved ones who had been sold away. The founders had created a country that tolerated it, even if they hoped to set it on a path to extinction. Lincoln himself had declared on this very spot four years earlier, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so and I have no inclination to do so, but God had a different plan. Lincoln was freely stating that he had not been in control of the nation's fate, a confession of weakness rare for any politician, nor could he say how much suffering the nation had yet to endure. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may be, 
may speedily pass away, he said. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so it must be said still, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He was quoting here the 19th Psalm, which calls on fallen man to humbly accept the will of the Almighty as beyond human understanding. What Lincoln was saying was astonishing. For the first time, an American president in an inaugural address was denouncing slavery as an unmitigated evil, speculating that God himself had rendered that judgment on it by punishing all Americans through this disastrous war. For the last four years, Lincoln had often repressed his hatred of slavery, keeping his focus on the political actions that would best advance the war effort and save the Union, carefully calibrating his actions to public opinion, to the intense irritation of such men as Chase and Douglas. Now Lincoln was perhaps revealing his heart. Slavery he was proposing was so grievous an abomination that God had willed this enormous catastrophe on the American people to end it. African Americans were stunned to hear the president speak this way. Negroes ejaculated bless the Lord in a low murmur at the end of almost every sentence, the New York Herald reported. Many wept. Looking down into the faces of people illuminated by the bright rays of the sun, one could see moist eyes and even tearful faces, Noah Brooks wrote. Moreover, Lincoln was suggesting that Americans had earned their terrible suffering and any still to come. All the treasure sunk into the war had been justly lost. Every drop of blood in this ocean of carnage had been justly spilled. Well, that's a glimpse of the book. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with me. In the hope I uh, shouldn't have stayed at home, I look forward to answering any questions you might have tomorrow. Uh, you can also reach me at my website, edacorn.com. That's E-D-A-C-H-O-R-N.com. And you can just click on a contact uh, button to reach me. So I thank everybody for uh, joining me today and uh, I wish you well. Professor David Reynolds is a historian and literary scholar who has written or edited 16 books, among them such prize-winning works as Walt Whitman's America, John Brown, Abolitionist, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America, and Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson. A native of Providence, Rhode Island, he received his BA from Amherst College, his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, and has taught at several colleges and universities. Since 1906, he has served as a distinguished professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Professor Reynolds is a proponent of what he calls cultural biography, a form that contextualizes historical figures in their era. His studies might be termed times and life rather than life and times biographies. His latest book, Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times, is a work of such stupendous erudition and such vast scope that it calls to mind a line by Walt Whitman, I am large, I contain multitudes. Unlike most pre uh, presidential biographies, this which, which focused on, now uh, let me start over again. This is really it's clumsy, okay. Professor David Reynolds is a historian and literary scholar who has written or edited 16 books, among them such prize-winning works as Walt Whitman's America, John Brown, Abolitionist, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America, and Walk, Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson. A native of Providence, Rhode Island, 
He received his BA from Amherst College, his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and has taught at several colleges and universities. Since 1906, he has served as a distinguished professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. Professor Reynolds is a proponent of what he calls cultural biography, a form that contextualizes historical figures in their era. His studies might be termed times and life rather than life and times biographies. His latest book, Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Time, is a work of such stupendous erudition and such vast scope that it calls to mind a line by Walt Whitman, I am large, I contain multitudes. Unlike most presidential biographies, which focus on political and economic and economic and social contexts of their subjects lives, Abe contains a cornucopia of information about the cultural milieu in which Lincoln lived. A noteworthy contribution of the book is its portrayal of Lincoln as a leftist abolitionist who loathed racism, a radical anti-racist whose underlying radicalism on race made him just as progressive as the foremost congressional champions of racial egalitarianism. Abe has been hailed by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 10 best books of the year. My only objection to Professor Reynolds' thousand page biography is that it is too short. Please join me in virtually welcoming Professor David Reynolds. I want to thank Michael Burlingame and the Abraham Lincoln Association for having me here um, at the meeting. Um, I just want to say that without Michael's work, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln Studies would not be anywhere near where it is today. So uh, it's uh, wonderful to be hosted by him and by the association. Um, my book, Abe, uh, is a cultural biography of America's greatest president and its central historical figure. It re reveals that Lincoln, far from distanced from the culture of his time, was thoroughly immersed in it. Even though he attended school for less than a year, he had scattered periods of uh, three months of peace uh, on the frontier. Uh, when he entered the presidency, he was neither inexperienced nor unprepared as someone like David Donald once said. To the contrary, he redefined democracy precisely because he had experienced culture in all its dimensions, from high to low, sacred to profane, conservative to radical, sentimental to subversive. Lincoln traversed what Ralph Waldo Emerson called the whole scale of the language from the most elegant to the most low and vile. In Emerson's words, a great style of hero draws equally from all classes, all extremes of society till we say the very dogs believe in him. Emerson singled out Lincoln as the person who most fully represented this breadth of vision, Emerson wrote, Abraham Lincoln is perhaps the most remarkable example of this class that we have seen. A man who is at home and welcomed with the humblest and with a spirit and a practical vein in the times of terror that commanded the admiration of the wisest. His heart was as great as the world, but there was no room in it to hold the memory of a wrong. In this talk, I'm going to discuss a few largely forgotten cultural phenomena that influenced Lincoln. Among them were reform movements. Uh, the first movement in which Lincoln became involved was um, temperance, one of the most popular reforms uh, in the era of astoundingly high alcohol consumption, the average annual consumption uh, per capita was about three, three times what it is today. Lincoln had lots of experience with the temperance, temperance movement. As an adolescent in Indiana, he wrote a temperance article that was published in the newspaper. In Springfield in 1838, he signed the Constitution of the Sangamon Temperance Society 
and formally pledged never to drink ardent, ardent spirits, which was redundant in his case because uh, he didn't really like the taste of alcohol and said he said it made it made him feel flabby and undone. So, uh, but he he thought he could help out in advancing the cause. And in the 1840s, he rode rode by a, a buggy horse and buggy uh, around central Illinois, giving temperance talks. During the Civil War, he greeted a delegation of the Sons of Temperance by declaring, intemperance is one of the greatest, if not the very greatest of all evils among mankind. But he added a note of caution saying, the mode of cure is one about which there may be differences of opinion. <clears throat> this issue of how to approach temperance and other popular reforms was one he had thought about for a long time. During his young manhood, he was exposed to what I call dark reform, that is denunciations of vice that exposed social abuses in sensational images so graphic that the images themselves, rather than the abuses, seize our attention. Lincoln had ample experience exposure to this kind of uh, gloomy rhetoric. Mason Weems, one of his favorite authors, wrote the popular drunkard's looking glass in which a man lured by the devil gets drunk and murders his father, rapes his sister, and hangs himself. As a teenager in Indiana, Lincoln heard the dark temperance song, John Anderson's Lamentation, about an alcoholic who was about to be executed for murdering his wife dark temperance language filled sermons in newspapers and achieved best-selling status in the Reverend George uh, Cheever's 1835 tract, Deacon Giles Distillery, which pictures a still in which devils produce barrels of rum emblazoned with labels like sickness, poverty, death, hell, and the like. Many prominent abolitionists also used dark reform rhetoric William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator, which first appeared in 1831, uh, and abolitionist writings of the decade, such as Theodore Dwight Welch's Slavery As It Is, or George Bourne's Slavery Illustrated, were full of denunciations of Southern slaveholders who were portrayed as cruel tyrants. Few major uh, anti-slavery works omitted scenes of whipping, ear cropping, uh, branding or other forms of torture. And to illustrate uh, Lincoln's uh, response to some of this uh, material, I'd like to share my screen, uh, PowerPoint. Um, during the 1830s, uh, as a young politician in Illinois, Lincoln himself sometimes used such dark reform rhetoric. When criticizing the Van Buren administration, he said that the great volcano at Washington aroused and directed by the evil spirit that reigns there is belching forth the lava of political corruption on which are riding, riding like demons on the waves of hell, the imps of that evil spirit and fiendishly taunting all those who dare to resist its destroying course. When he attacked local politicians in Illinois, he sometimes used what was known as slasher gaff uh, rhetoric, which brought him close to having a duel with the Democrat James Shield. Fortunately, the duel didn't go forward Lincoln thought he could beat him very easily, but actually <laughs> Shields had been a fencing instructor and, uh, instructor and <laughs> knew how to use the sword uh, quite well. But any, uh, way, at any rate, the uh, duel was, was called off uh, by friends who interfered at the last moment. Before long, Lincoln came out against such uh, dark reform rhetoric, which he found divisive and inflammatory. In the 1837 statement on anti-slavery reform, that he made uh, with fellow politician Dan Stone. Uh, he said the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, but 
the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than to abate its evils. And he was coming to realize that this kind of dark rhetoric didn't really lead anywhere that was uh, really super positive. <laughs> uh, and so uh, in his 1842 speech to the Springfield Washingtonian Temperance Society, um, it showed him reacting against sensational uh, reform language. In the speech, he complained about reformers who used thundering tones of anathema and denunciation and who branded wrongdoers as moral pestilences and the authors of all the vice and misery and crime in the land. And he explained in the speech, the conduct of men is designed to be influenced by persuasion, kind, unassuming persuasion. Uh, he went on to uh, uh, say that to win somebody over, you have to be compassionate. Therein is a drop of honey that catches his heart, which say what he will is the great and high road to his reason, which when once gained, you will find but little trouble in convincing his judgment of the justice of your cause. And um, he learned in time to drop his early slashing style, preferring to use reason and persuasion this applied to his major speeches on slavery. And here he differed from others who uh, denounced slavery in his groundbreaking Peoria speech in 1854. For example, his loathing of slavery comes out as strongly as it does in any work by the most radical abolitionist. And yet the terseness uh, and forcefulness of the language distinguished it sharply from much anti-slavery uh, writing of the era, forceful in the sense of being really persuasive, rhetorically persuasive rather than denunciatory. He talked of the monstrous injustice of slavery, but he avoided the dark reform rhetoric of many political speeches uh, of the 1850s, such as Senator Charles Sumner's blistering the crime against Kansas, uh, which describes the slave power as the great terrestrial serpent with its loathsome folds coiled around the whole land. Or Frederick Douglass's, what to the slave is the 4th of July with its, with its images of slavery as a horrible reptile, the venomous creature that is nursing the tender breast of our youthful Republic while your hands are full of blood as he addressed the, uh, the, slave, uh, the slaveholders of the South. When we think of uh, Lincoln's major speeches on slavery, um, particularly Cooper Union, for example, uh, we see him continuing to resist the prevailing penchant for dark reform. In his major speeches, he exposed the moral and human injustice of slavery without resorting to heavy emphasis on the horrors of slavery, slavery or the cruelty of slaveholders. He opted to use what he called in his Washingtonian address, the techniques of persuasion and reason. He wanted to avoid the excesses of dark reform, which he knew could make a divided nation even more divided. He also fought the dis disunity represented by what was known as the isms. That is the variety of reform groups, such as spiritualism, nativism, women's rights, mesmerism, and radical abolitionism. When the Whig Party broke into many fragments, there arose the Republican Party, which in Lincoln's words, was formed, quote, of strange discordant and even hostile elements gathered from the four winds. So he knew the real need for unity uh, in his party. Uh, but that unity was not seen by the opponents, the Democrats and also the South. This is kind of the Southern view of the Republican Party. It's a cartoon called The Worship of the North. Here we see the South's view uh, of the Republican Party as a chaotic mixture of isms. Inscribed on the brick altar in the center of the picture. At the base of the altar is Puritanism, reflecting the Southern idea that all the wild movements of the North, especially abolitionism, 
were wicked products originally of the early Puritan New Englanders uh, from whom grew all these uh, kind of odd movements uh, uh, in the North. On the bricks above the base, we see witch burning, socialism, free, free love, spirit wrapping, atheism, rationalism, and Negro worship. All of, the, all of them referring to uh, alleged isms in the North as, as the South uh, saw them. On the top of the altar is the bust of Lincoln who is overlooking uh, a scene in which the anti-slavery preacher Henry Ward Beecher stabs a white man who is sprawled out dying. He's a sacrifice to the supposed uh, uh, God of the North, who is the, the African-American man sitting on top of the altar, who behind whom is a spear that was given to him to launch a slave revolt by John Brown, whose statue stands to the black man's left. Other figures in the cartoon include Senator Charles Sumner, who holds a torch to help Beecher take aim at his white victim. The anti-slavery editor, Horace Greeley, who swings incense in the left corner and Harriet Beecher Stowe, you can barely see her there uh, on the right side who kneels in prayer. Um, she of course being the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was virtually banned in the South. And if you owned the book in the South, you could go to jail. Uh, one African-American man went to jail for 10 years for, for owning, um, having Uncle Tom's Cabin in, in his house. So this is how the Republicans, Republicans were viewed uh, from the Southern point of view. And here's another picture of the isms. Here Lincoln is being carried into a so-called lunatic asylum He's seen as totally crazy by uh, Southerners and by uh, conservative Democrats. And he's looking back at all these uh, representatives of the isms, including a woman's rights figure who wants, uh, well, she's actually, uh, yeah, she, she wants to uh, make women superior to men. And then a free, free love woman who wants to, who feels passional attraction to Lincoln. And then there's a Mormon there who, uh, uh, it says that he wants uh, to institute polygamy. And then there's an African-American who says, I want everyone to have a share. Uh, no, he, he says, uh, I want uh, the white man to have no rights that colored people are bound to respect, which is kind of a reversal of the Dred Scott dec decision, which said that uh, black people have no rights that white people have to respect. So. Uh, this is the way the South viewed uh, Lincoln as the embodiment of all these weird, uh, odd uh, um, reform movements. As a matter of fact, however, uh, it, was, it was really wrong, very inaccurate uh, to associate Lincoln with, with them. He actually took a middle position on the isms of his day. He didn't fully embrace uh, any of them, although he didn't completely distanced himself from them, from those who did. Most of the people, the supporters such as women's rights figures and so forth, actually supported the Repu Republican party as in fact did, did nativists. So he had to be a little careful. At the same time, he didn't closely identify with, with any of them. He really took a kind of a, a, a middling course uh, with them. And he tried to concentrate on one ism, what he called Douglas ism. That ism, he wrote, he used that word, that ism, Douglas ism. He was referring to the westward spread of slavery threatened by Stephen Douglas uh, with the Kansas Nebraska Act, which opened up the uh, Western territory for slavery. And he said, that ism is all that now stands in the way of an early and complete success of republicanism. So he really wanted to concentrate on the, the one uh, ism of the westward uh, spread of slavery. He said, the chief effect of Douglasism is to change the moral tone and temper of the American people by inviting them to become indifferent about human rights. He went on to say that all of Douglas's sentiments spring from the view that slavery 
is not wrong. Slavery is not wrong. So he wanted to really uh, kind of hone in on the injustice, the moral horror of, of uh, the moral injustice of, of slavery. And the reason that he was able to position himself effectively with regard to uh, the isms can be sub summed up in the word Blondin. Charles Blondin was a French tightrope walker who in 1859 toured America and performed incredible feats, most notably his repeated crossings in Niagara Falls. He crossed over the falls frontward, backward, on, still, on stilts at night, sometimes with a man on his back or pushing a wheelbarrow. And uh, Lincoln was often compared to Blondin in the press, and he made the comparison himself at length. In cartoons like these, we see um, Lincoln as Blondin. Blacks are often pictured uh, in these Blondin cartoons because the issues of sla slavery and race uh, were especially uh, divisive, of course. And uh, if Link Lincoln felt that if as president, he made a strong move in either direction uh, on these key issues, he felt he could completely upset the political scene. He could, in effect, fall off the rope and possibly he thought the nation could fall with him. In the midst of the Civil War, he was approached uh, separately by two, two delegations uh, who asked him why he had, hadn't acted from the beginning uh, much more radically against slavery in the war. Lincoln told them, if I were blonde and pushing wheelbarrow filled with America's whole future, crossing Niagara Falls. Would you say Blondin, move left, move right, Blondin, do this, do that? No, you would let me stay balanced exactly in the center. As an example of the terrible thing that he thought could happen if he strayed from the center, he pointed to the border states, which were slave states that were still part of the Union and yet which could at any moment tumble into the Confederacy. If we lose Kentucky, he declared, we lose everything. We just, we just lo lo lose the war. <laughs> and there were four other states that were in the same position. He, you know, we, we're just gonna lose. So he really was forced by uh, uh, that factor to, uh, if by nothing else, to stay very close to the center. And he could easily alienate uh, Kentucky or Maryland or, you know, or uh, Tennessee or Missouri. Um, so uh, in his extremely divided time, he stuck, he saw the wisdom of sticking close to the center while firmly pushing for social justice. Just as useful as Blondin is in understanding Lincoln, so are two other Bs, Barnum and Bohoys. P.T. Barnum was the great showman uh, in his museum on Broadway in New York, he featured many curiosities, including the Fiji mermaid, who was actually, uh, she was presented as this beautiful blonde naked woman in posters. <laughs> she was actually a salmon's head attached, uh, sewed to a monkey's tail, suspended in, in water. Uh, the woolly horse, giants, uh, dwarves, anything else that uh, fit what I call the est factor the biggest, fattest, tallest, oldest, strangest, and so forth. Lincoln was often compared to a Barnum exhibit because of his unusual looks. Um, there's a picture of him uh, in kind of a typical anti-Lincoln cartoon being compared to this exhibit called What Is It, who is actually a, an African-American teenager. It's a very racist kind of cartoon. Uh, and Barnum put on him on exhibit as um, the missing link between um, the ape and, and the human being. And Lincoln and Horace Greeley are greeting him as a, <clears throat> an intellectual and noble creature. Uh, and it's wonderful that he's been discovered at this time. So uh, he can pr prove the superiority of the colored over the Anglo-Saxon race. He's gonna be a worthy successor uh, you know, to me in the presidency and so forth. It's, it's a really kind of a typically sort of racist um, anti-Lincoln uh, 
cartoon. Um, but uh, another way that Barnum work was uh, worked was more positively. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the whole 1860 campaign, the rail splitter campaign was kind of a Barnum exhibit because by this time Lincoln was out of his shirt, shirt sleeves. He'd been a lawyer who had tried over 5,000 cases and so forth. And uh, he didn't, he used to, he at one time lived on the frontier, but that whole front, frontier image was um, resurrected during the 1860 campaign. Uh, and he was peddled uh, to the public, sold to the public as, as aid, the Illinois rail splitter. Uh, and uh, he didn't particularly like the cognom cognomen of Abe, but he uh, said uh, all through the campaign, my friends have been calling me honest old Abe and I have been elected mainly on that cry. So he even he admitted, even though he didn't particularly, he preferred to be called Lincoln, uh, but he kind of admitted that for the masses, Abe, Abe really worked uh, in sort of a Barnum-esque way. He was also elected uh, in 1860 because of the young vote. In a lecture that he gave around that time, he said, we've all heard of young America. He's the most current youth of the day. And that was true, but Lincoln's Republican party had a lot of catching up to do in order to win the young vote. Uh, which had long been won by Democrats. Back in the 1840s, when he was campaigning for Zachary Taylor, Lincoln wrote that his party must attract the shrewd wild boys around town. He wrote that to Herndon, his law partner. And that was his name for uh, uh, the shrewd wild bo uh, boys was his uh, description of the famous Pahoy, <coughs> who was the rough but smart working class figure who was given to street fights, running with his machine to help douse fires and promenading on the streets with his gehal. By the mid 1850s, the Bohoy was a national figure who appeared in different versions as the Illinois sucker. Uh, that was supposedly named after a fish, the sucker fish. Um, the Indiana Hoosier, uh, in a sense, Lincoln was both of those, <laughs> both the sucker and who, and he was called that, called the sucker, the Wisconsin Wolverine, and so forth. The Bohoys had once idolized Stephen Douglas, but because of the increasingly pro-slavery laws that were passed in the 1850s, many of them ended up on the side of the anti-slavery Republicans, by the uh, particularly the northern versions of the Bohoy. By 1860, the Bohoys uh, formed the Wide Awakes the young Lincoln supporters who marched with torches in, in their coats, carrying placards for Lincoln uh, and free soil and liberty for, for enslaved uh, blacks. And um, this is an 1860 uh, pro-Lincoln cartoon uh, showing the importance of the young, young vote, young America at the ballot box, strangling and strangling serpents of disunion and secession. It's kind of based on then the young Hercules who in the myth strangles the serpents. Uh, and uh, here's young America in uh, really in the, uh, the representative of, of the Republican party uh, rising up and, and uh, supposedly or hopefully uh, strangling secession. Um, just as the Bahoy figure uh, helps explain uh, Lincoln's uh, popularity and uh, electability. Another cultural phenomenon, popular humor, illuminates his position on race. We all know that humor and storytelling were important uh, psychological outlets for Lincoln, but they served also a distinctly political uh, function as well, particularly in the case of Lincoln's favorite humorist, David Ross Locke. Locke was an Ohio journalist who had attended the, attended the Lincoln uh, Douglas, Douglas debates of 1858. He met Lincoln in a hotel room, admired Lincoln very deeply. A couple of years after the debates when Lincoln was president, Locke started appearing in uh, newspapers as 
petroleum nasby a drunken nasty lout who was always spouting racist epithets making free use of the n-word to impersonate these kind of racist democrats copperheads of the north uh, he wanted to show just how repulsive uh, these figures were and so he kind of takes their persona inhabits them and it came off as at that time as kind of funny uh, some of them are hard to read today some of his sketches but but lincoln loved them the uh, public loved them uh, so much that three or four people said that uh, uh, Locke was actually, uh, the Nasby papers were actually as important as Sherman or Grant uh, in overthrowing slavery because uh, his humor worked kind of like acid uh, on the uh, uh, pro-slavery faction in, in, the, in the North. And Lincoln uh, uh, memorized a lot of Locke's sketches and carried them around with him and so forth. And once he even jokingly said, I would trade uh, places with Locke uh, if I could write like him. I actually didn't feel that way, but uh, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how uh, much that Locke actually meant to him. And uh, that gets us to the point that, that uh, you know, Lincoln, uh, if you cherry pick him enough through his works, you can find, particularly early on, certain rather conservative statements and so forth. But it's absolutely wrong to call him a racist. Um, he lived uh, within three blocks of him in Springfield. There were a number of African-Americans to whom he became very close to, including his barber, uh, William Fleurville, and there was a guy named Donegan and, and several others. And then during the, the Civil War, when he met Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, they said that he was in the White House. They said he was really one uh, the least least prejudiced uh, white man that they'd ever met. Uh, and when the radical abolitionist uh, Martin Delaney came to him in the White House, he was really moved uh, to meet uh, Lincoln. And he was so radical at the time that he was um, beyond really what we would call Black Lives Matter. But he, uh, uh, Lincoln appointed him as uh, the highest uh, ranking African-American officer uh, major of infantry. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Delaney didn't have the opportunities to serve because the war ended soon after that. But uh, when he heard that Lincoln had been assassinated, he um, proposed the, the construction of a statue that was going to be of uh, an African woman rising from her knees and pouring out thousands of tears, tears uh, that's how deeply uh, Delaney himself cried for a long time when he heard about the death of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, that's the statue that he envisaged. And he wanted that statue to be um, funded by African-Americans that were emancipated. That statue was never created. However, another one uh, on the other side of the picture here called the Emancipation Memorial was constructed and was funded by African-Americans uh, in 1876. And, uh, you know, recently, uh, this statue has become very controversial. It was taken down, a copy of it was taken down in Boston. It was attacked uh, in, uh, around the country, uh, and removed uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, particularly, well, in Boston in, in uh, late December. But it's, it's, it kind of reminds me of uh, taking the name Abraham Lincoln off of Abraham Lincoln, um, high school in San Francisco. It's a real misunderstanding of what Lincoln meant for African-Americans and for white Americans. And Mar as Martin Luther King said um, in his 18, 1963 uh, I Have a Dream speech, uh, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln holds in the statue in his right hand, uh, came as a joyous daybreak, joyous daybreak for millions of enslaved people. And we can never underestimate that. It's really wrong to impose today's values on the 19th century. And it's very, very important for all of us uh, to uh, understand uh, Lincoln in his own time. Uh, not just Lincoln, but, but other people as well. Uh, if we don't do that, then we really risk 
uh, distorting history and really, uh, really miss out on the essential um, goodness of uh, and the sense of moral fiber and justice and honor and integrity of our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much. Thank you.